First, I don't know, who, who was here last year? And who was here last year and the year before? Okay, so you guys know me, fuck it. So this is all German stuff about conversion optimization. <laughs> Not relevant to you, maybe. But what's that? Who knows that picture? Where is it from? Yeah, Hoshua, please. 2001 Space Odyssey, yeah. 2000 was a thing with a date change, you know, yeah. 2001 Space Odyssey, yeah. And who knows what is that movie about? Nobody knows, right? That's what makes that movie so brilliant, right? You see it and you think, yeah, it answered questions I didn't raise. And I don't understand the answers. What a great movie. So inspiring. So I try the same with my talk right now, right? So <laughs> one question of the movie is, why are we here? Why am I here? Why are you here? Meatballs? Coffee? Wi-Fi? <sighs> kind of. I think one of the most important things why you are here, why you may be here, is to find some gold nuggets that others present to you, OK? As conversion optimizers, we, we are like people that are searching for gold nuggets the whole day. What could we do on the website? What could we improve? Let's test it. So, and if it works, it's like finding a gold nugget saying, yeah, I had an uplift. Look, everybody, I had an uplift. And if you do that on conferences and you present a case study with an uplift, everybody's raising his uh, mobile phone to make a picture of the slide. So all this conference about tactical stuff, which means looking for other people that found gold nuggets and trying to implement them so they turn out to be your own gold nuggets, but it doesn't work that good, right? So, of course, we're always interested to see what works and what doesn't. But the truth is, you are here because you want to improve. You want to find even more stuff. You want more uplift, more successful experiments, whatever. So what could you do? Buy a bigger pan to find gold? You know who became the richest people in the gold rush? Yeah, shovels, shovels. The, one, the ones who were selling the shovels, yeah? These became the richest. So, forget the text dicts, for, forget the golden nuggets. What I would like to talk about right now is this. You know what it is? That's the fucking biggest shovel on that planet. Right? That's optimizer speaking, I have the biggest shovel, right? And that's what online marketers see immediately, a mighty tool, a massive tool, which, yeah, in my mind, I have this desire, I just have to implement that tool, and it produces a massive amount of uplift automatically. John Ekman says, you know what the, the fancy part about marketing automatization is? There is no automatization. It's hard work, still. So, but of course, you need a tool. You need somebody that's operating that here. This guy maybe feels very mighty. Maybe it's a woman, even feels more mighty. I don't know. And look, what have we overseen? Sorry? The traffic? Now, the traffic is, the, is inside the mountain. So, the person who takes credit for it, that's a very clever answer, Craig, yeah. Now, I, I would like to point on the process we don't understand, but I think representative for that is, is this little vehicle that nobody knows what's it for, uh, why does it have this thing behind, and when is it going, but I'm sure if it's not working properly, the whole gold mining process stops, and a couple of billion dollars are lost. So, why are we take, talking about this gold mining thing, and about building a gold mine instead of searching for every single nugget? It's about principles, because principles, you're able to scale them. If somebody put his search field on top of the page, made it bigger, had 70% conversion rate uplift, he was maybe lucky, 
1% chance, or he measured wrong, 99% chance. If you implement it, 100% chance that it won't work for you. So back in 2014, when I was here the first time, I showed this thing. You remember it? This is a typical example of user experience gone completely wrong. And this is not just about user experience, this is about corporate culture. Imagine you would like to buy this Dell Inspiron thing for a thousand euros, a lot of money. <sighs> Imagine you're ready to buy, you use the checkout, and the only thing this checkout responds to you is the amount of mistakes you made, right? This is German, amount of mistakes, 10. Imagine this would happen in a real-time situation, a real situation. This I showed two years ago. So I thought, it's not that good bashing websites. I mean, it's full of this problem. Uh, the, the highlight was this one saying, the selected payment method makes your delivery process longer because you're too dumb to buy, right? <laughs> so this is two years old. Maybe some of you remember. I thought, give this Dell people a new chance. Who has a Dell? Can't, raise your hand. So you actually used that website. How did you do that? <laughs> you bought it somewhere else, that's clever. <laughs> that's clever. Anybody who bought it online? I really appreciate that high motivation of you. <laughs> it's not that easy. Yeah, you deserve flowers from Dell, not from me. Why? Because, I'm sorry, it's in German, so you have to trust me. Um, anybody, speaks Ger <laughs> anybody speaks German? Why? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> to see if they can trust me, you know, high motivation. You see, again, I want to buy this Dell thing, 1,000 euros, I go, I go to the Dell uh, cash desk, say, yeah, I want to check out, I really want that Dell. And the first thing that says is, did you ever think about fraud of your credit card? Why? I mean, when I look at that form, you see how my motivation is rising in my body because I really adore that Dell so much, so I take every single pain to buy it. No. It says to avoid problems and uh, delivery, problems, whatever. No, that's not the thing you should talk about. And it's getting worse. If you think, yeah, I really like that form, it's really in looking great fun, they don't stop me now. I will buy this Dell. Then you have to give them four telephone numbers. <laughs> not one or two or three, four. And the fourth one has to be a fax number. So you have a fax, <laughs> one with this thermal paper? No, only the first. Yeah, you're right. I'm, I'm just kidding. The thing is, there is a certain moment uh, where the Dell website really gets your attention. And that's when they're talking about tax redemption status, right? It means you don't have to pay taxes. How great is that? Who doesn't have to pay taxes? Who wants not to pay taxes? <laughs> right. So. Look what happens on that form. Tax redemption status. I don't have a tax redemption status. I have a tax redemption status, and that's how you get it. So forget that, Dell. Let's talk seriously about how not to pay taxes. <laughs> Great. How not to sell a Dell, right? I accept the terms and conditions. I don't accept the terms and conditions. What happens? I already filled in everything. <laughs> Fuckers, sorry. <laughs> they really, and that's why it's, I think that's why it is a result. And still, if you make any mistakes, eh, number of mistakes, 11. <laughs> so, for me, why is this um, a result, not of user experience? I mean, it's a bad user experience, but it's a result of corporate culture. Because it shows with every single pixel of that screen, that Dell just doesn't care. Come on, you're stupid customers. Whatever. So, 
These are the other examples. I will, I will talk about booking.com as well because every optimizer has to talk about booking.com these days. Some about Suzuki, some about booking.com. And what's the difference between these two corporations? There's one fundamental difference that means booking.com is telling me what I've done right, not what I've done wrong. Dell is all about problems and what I did wrong, but this is what I did right. It says, congratulations, you found the cheapest room in that hotel. Oh, that feels so good. And it even tells me I'm a booking genius, you know, and I save money. That's all full of positive news, and I can fill in my name correctly and my email address. I feel like a superhero <laughs> today, like a booking champ. So what I want to talk about that this all influences users' motivation. So I come to a website as a user with a, let's say, God-given motivation or context-given motivation or whatever situation-given motivation. Anyway, I have a motivation. And websites can work with this. And with Dell and Booking, you see two examples of um, two different ways of seeing things. Most optimizers see the difficulties, the problems, the barriers, right? So um, we segmented all A-B tests we've done for like two years and divided them into two groups. One group is where we worked on eliminating these barriers. So this gave a certain uplift. But group two are the websites where we tried to raise the user's motivation. So the booking.com side. And the funny thing is, these websites, they had a five time higher uplift, or these experiments had a five time higher uplift. And a lot of people know this effect. So if you're uh, educating your children, for example, a lot of parents know that it works better to give children a positive outcome on their behavior than a negative one. So most of our experiences look like this. E-commerce means put tons of things in one room <laughs> Let millions of people uh, go beside that stuff and hope that one or two or three out of 100 will buy something. And now I get critical because I think user research is good, but it's limited. Because if we now tell people, you see, this is the shop, please buy something back there. We see, oh, you can't go there. So we, we need a new navigation. Let, let's make the room so people can walk there. Implement a faceted navigation that could be the learning of a user research. But again, this is about eliminating barriers. It's good, but this has a five times smaller uplift than something else. And look what, this is a, one of the most successful German supermarket chains. And what I think is impressive is if you look at the amount of money they invest in creating that atmosphere and creating that user experience. It's about the right lightning, it's about the right uh, smell, do you say smell? <laughs> it's about uh, a little bit of fog going over the fresh fruit, the way you're running around, that the milk is at the end, how things are placed, and there are millions of people arranging the, the, all these products, right? So, so it looks good if all the Clients came, bought everything, so they refill it. That's a lot of work. They invest millions or billions of euros, so everything looks fine. And that's the difference between real brick and mortar stores and e-commerce. We don't invest that money. It's not that we think we could, but we just don't do it. So again, something I showed two years ago, just to fresh everybody up. We spend money for traffic, we spend money for website, and we spend money for tools like web analytics. So this is our reality. What we completely forget is there are some mistakes on that picture, right? If you were here, you remember them? What are the mistakes? Yeah, that was one mistake. Second mistake? Users are not smiling. You forgot that. They hate you. Because right? your website sucks. 
So they're not smiling, they don't have the credit card. And yeah, everything goes through the user. They think what they understand, then they maybe use their hand to click and that's what you can measure. So, what I want to say this year is actionable outcome number one, <laughs> do an exercise, which means ask yourself, how much do you spend for traffic, for the website, maintenance, the whole thing, software, tools, for analytics? And then ask yourself, how much do you spend for the blue line, really understanding users? Calculate that ratio and feel in sorrow. <laughs> So change it, think about it, change it. You need to understand more about the people. Without that, you can't change anything. This is a very old model, S-O-R paradigm. It's a psychological model. And it means when we are experimenting on websites, it means we're changing the stimulus to change the reaction. So when we want to be optimizers, we have to understand that principles to generate great uplifts. So I'll show you one of the most important principles of every human being in his behavior. Maybe some of you know it. It's called the marshmallow test. You know it? Some, yeah. It's about children. And they can't resist to wait for a second marshmallow. It takes a couple of minutes until they get the second one. Look at what happens. If Preet turns up the volume, Preet, you do. Oh. I didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's still here. What, what, oh, sorry. The thing is, what, what you see while Preet is turning to, trying to turn up the volume is, these guys get the first marshmallow, and they develop certain strategies how to bridge the couple of minutes. So they feel physical pain, physical pain. Um, one, one strategy is not to look at the marshmallow, ignore it. Another strategy is to eat it from the inside out. So nobody sees that you've already eaten it. Not that good uh, sometimes. He tries. The thing is, about 85% of the children are not able to wait. Around 85% of the children will eat it right now. Only 15% of the children wait. Uh, most children do, do that, eat it straight away. I would have done it as well. <laughs> I, I confess. Don't laugh, Carl. You would, have, you would have eaten it as well, right? <laughs> so this is one of the guys uh, who made it. He, he waited a couple of minutes to get the second marshmallow. So he eats that. <laughs> this is it. So uh, why is it important to understand? The principle is called instant gratification. And it's important because our bodies need sugar. And this little bastard in our brain, called nucleus accumbens, is responsible for all the bad things in the world. Yeah? Alcohol, drugs, Apple products. If we <laughs> really desire them, nothing can stop us. It's a question of instant gratification. Nucleus accumbens is sending out dopamine. Dopamine is like crystal meth. It's your own crystal meth uh, factory in your brain. So it makes it feel good and relaxed. So instant gratification. Now I come to the point. <laughs> what about instant gratification? Where's instant gratification on that website? You know it, maybe. Sorry? Yes, how many people liked something? The notifications here, this, this thing. You know, you click on it and you get a reward, like, ah, oh, this one liked your post, this one liked your picture, you commented on something. So this is like, like ah, crystal math. Dopamine. So, the growth canvas actually is a model where this principle is in the center. It means we can't see conversions as an abstract data thing. Conversion is the result of user goals. Sorry, I couldn't translate it. This says user goals and business goals. So if they unite, we will get uh, an uplift. 
So if we forget that, if we don't do user research, you're scaring me. You're wrong. That's <laughs> really? So we should ask ourselves, who's our customer? What problem are you solving, guys? And the most important question is, what problem are you really solving? The real problem. We call it implicit goals. And there's a difference between implicit and explicit goals. Just to show you, the explicit goal of this product is to bring you from point A to B. That's the explicit goal. What do you think is the implicit goal? Status, yeah, that's nicely said, yeah. To joy it, but to everybody see how much you are joying from going from A to B. So, what do you think makes BMW tons of money, as Pip would say? The explicit or the implicit goal? It's the implicit thing. So, exercise number two out of five, sorry Pip, I hurry up, <laughs> is ask yourself, what are the implicit goals? What are you really fulfilling on with your service or your website? Try to find answers on that questions. Bring them into a B test, and you will see big uplifts. It's important, and that's why I say this is my critique on user research. You can't interview BMW clients and ask them, did you buy this car to pretend you have a longer dick or whatever? <laughs> did I say that? Sorry, am I allowed to say things like that? Thank you. They won't answer. So, we asked that personas are a great way of researching the implicit goals of people. We tested this. Um, Amazon, where's the um, instant gratification? Here, by now, not later. We tested this. Uh, Booking.com, give me good news. Instant gratification looks like this. You get it uh, for the best price, and if you order it now, you get it tomorrow. Makes 16% uplift, 22% more revenue. So that's, forget that nugget, doesn't work for you. <laughs> it's tactics, it's one of the few tactics I show. But I wanted to show you how you can put this psychological principles together for a business model. Amazon is great in putting these things together. So this is what you should really copy from Amazon, putting psychological principles together. Who is an Amazon Prime member? Who is an Amazon Prime member and doesn't dare to raise his hand? Okay, so more than half of this room is full of people who already paid $40 to get Amazon Prime. And you know that effect. When you go to a restaurant, all you can eat, I paid $40. I eat as much as I can. You don't? <laughs> Carl, come on. <laughs> so... That's a 70% conversion rate. People don't leave things on the table if they already paid 40, 40 euros. So that's commitment, psychological principle of commitment. So I know there are a lot of models with all these persuasion principles, the six Cialdini things and so on. If you Google list of cognitive biases, you come to Wikipedia and find this big list of all the cognitive biases that are there. I think around 200, so, so we don't have time for that. Pip said. So, I wanted to say, Jeff Bezos, that's a slide from two years ago. Jeff Bezos, he really engineered his growth by putting together instant gratification by now. He has it copyrighted or registered as a trademark. Convenience, make it easy so people form a habit because they get instant gratification after one day I get my delivery. And last thing he added was Amazon Prime commitment. So this whole curve, and by the way, right now it's somewhere here or here, I don't know, up, up in the sky. This is no accident. This is really engineered growth. This is not about things on the website, think about it. It's about how people react on the stimulus, deeply implemented in the business model. So test that stuff, at least. I, I call it one psycho growth hack a month and you will quadruple your, your uplifts. So, we're nearly at the end. That's a growth canvas. I was talking about this qualitative stuff, like persuasion here. 
but you, of course, also need data to verify that it's right. If you did that, you have a lot of hypotheses you can test. And the next step is how to prioritize all these hypotheses. So there is the Pi framework. You know, you know the Pi framework? Some of you? There is the ICE framework. Who did that? You know, you use it? Who's inventor of the ICE framework? You remember it? Uh, I also remember. The thing is, they both have an I here, which stands for impact. So there's a framework all, all I called, why should your opinion matter? <laughs> because how could I rate the impact if I didn't test it, right? So ask yourself three little things. If you change stuff on a website, Question number one, will your change be perceived? If not, it can't change behavior. Question number two, is the change relevant? You need personas and customer journeys to know what's relevant for the people. Exercise number two was all about the question, what's relevant for your people? Implicit goals, right? If you did your homework, you can answer this question. Third question, after that you can say, can it change behavior, really? If I give this to 100 people, will they change behavior? You can give points on that, as in the Pi framework, build a factor, and then all your hypotheses are prioritized. So there is a, a tool we did called iridion.com where you can put it into that tool. So and then you test it, and then you get growth. Right? That's the whole thing. It's as easy as that. <laughs> the thing is, not so many people are prioritizing their stuff, and not so many people are putting psychological principles as a core for their business models. So look at booking.com, instant gratification, and just to show you one last video, that all this stuff is not new, it's old stuff. This one is from 1962 and is called the Ash Elevator Experiment. You know that? 1962, so all we are doing is copying old stuff. Look at that, it's all about group pressure, and there's always one person with a red circle, that's the only per person who has no idea what this is all about. Everybody else are actors, so look what happens. Oh damn, you, you still don't preach, come on. <laughs> still no sound, so these people are entering the elevator, uh, they're actors, so they stand with their face to the wall. And the third person entering it, they found out you only need three persons. This guy is the only one who has no clue what's going on here. So he feels pressured just to stand the other way around because all these three other guys are doing it. So he has like some sweat pearls <laughs> on his forehead already. But of course, he is little by little changing the direction where he's standing. Google that on YouTube, it's funny to watch. So um, this is what uh, Booking.com is doing right now, look. That's what's going on on the website, everywhere. That's group pressure. Of course I have to book because everybody's booking here. And everybody who's trying scarcity but is not showing how many people are here, it's like, like standing in the middle of the street saying, I have five socks, only five. Only five left, but if nobody's buying them, oh, embarrassing. <laughs> so, exercise number four, ask yourself, where can you show how much is going on on your website? And hopefully, there is something going on on your website, because that's what booking.com does, and that's how successful they are. So, curiosity, scarcity, <coughs> cheering. This one I had at the beginning, saying, yeah, you found the cheapest room. Finally, we did it, Pip. I will finish in time. So, finally, this all doesn't work with a plan. And that's also in that model, saying you need a business plan, you need the right culture, you need the right skills, you need the right organization in, in your company. So, if this doesn't work, forget everything I said before. So just one simple slide for that, which is for business plan. It means do the math, you know. Look at your organic growth. It will become, it will get a dent. 
because organic growth is not endless. But if you're starting to say, let's have a 10% per year conversion uplift goal, then your curve will change a little bit, like this. It's only 10%, that's feasible. And for the really ambitious people, look what happens if you do 15% a year. That's a lot more. And the first time I was talking about this model was back in 2008. So I call it the back to the future curve. It would have looked like this if you started in 2008. This is what Pip calls tons of money, right? So if you think this is just a mathematical trick, that's the growth curve of Amazon, right? <laughs> Nothing more. So last exercise, build the business case. Go in Excel, write down what are your numbers, what happens if you improve it 10% per year, how much would it cost, how much do you pay for the testing tool, how much more resources do you need to do all that stuff. Calculate the case. These are your real levers. More uplift, more success rate in your experiments, better process, more efficiency, less cost. Then you're a real optimizer if you talk about this. So, that's it, friends. If you implement a process in your company, it needs, needs these five stages. Plan, analyze, prioritize, build, and then measure, learn. So that Eric Ries guy, he told us it's all about build, measure, learn. No. <laughs> There's a lot of hard work you have to do before. He forgot that. Oh. Damn it, shit, shit. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of work. And it's a result of a process, not trial and error. So that's it for me, thank you very much.